Hi, I'm Justin Rezus, and I'll be talking to you about our work Instant Block Confirmation in the Sleepy Model. This is a joint work with Vipul Goyal and Hanjin Lee. There are two primary approaches to modern blockchain. Uh, the first is proof of work, which unfortunately comes with high costs in the form of expensive hardware and high energy upkeep. Proof of stake aims to avoid these costs by using ownership of stake as the security mechanism instead of computational power. The proof of stake abstraction is that one unit of stake or one coin uh, is one party. However, this approach comes with its own particular problems. For example, you may have heard of the nothing at stake attack. In this work, we're focused on the problem of stake being owned by offline users. So this can happen for many reasons. For example, unexpected outages, users going on vacation, or frequently it's been very popular uh, for people to invest in cryptocurrencies as if they were traditional stocks. Such users typically don't care about um, mining, just about their valuation gain, and since they don't participate actively in the system, they don't contribute to its security. Pass and Shi studied the question of whether consensus was achievable even in the setting where the majority of stake might be owned by offline parties. Surprisingly, they showed that consensus is indeed achievable as long as the majority of online stake is owned by honest parties. However, their approach is a longest chain style approach, which comes with some downsides. Specifically, blocks need to be buried before they're confirmed. So once a block is added to the ledger, it needs to be followed by several more blocks before it can be considered to be confirmed. Snow White is a follow-up work to Pass and Shi, um, which extended their results into a full blockchain. And we can see on the screen that as the uh, adversary controls more and more stake in the system, the delay, the confirmation delay for Snow White uh, increases dramatically. And intuitively, this is due to uh, there being more forking as the adversary has more control over the system and more forks need to be resolved. This problem really seems inherent to longest chain style approaches, not Snow White in particular. An alternative approach is a Byzantine agreement based blockchain like Algorand. Byzantine agreement guarantees that each block is agreed upon before it enters the chain, regardless of the adversary's behavior. This means there are no forks and that transactions are instantly confirmed when they enter the ledger. Uh, this is what we aim to achieve. And we can see that Algorand does not suffer nearly as much in terms of delay as the adversary controls more and more stake in the system. Intuitively, this is because only a single decision has to be made here, uh, regardless of the amount of adversarial stake. In our work, we bring the advantages of Byzantine agreement style approaches to the Sleepy model. We present a blockchain that can securely progress even when most stake is owned by offline users and where there's no forking and no waiting for transactions to be buried. Our starting point is Algorand. In Algorand, uh, each block is chosen by a new committee. And the committee um, is chosen based on a lottery system. If your lottery ticket is high enough, you get to be on the committee. The lottery tickets are implemented via a cryptographic tool called the verifiable random function, which allows parties to choose their own tickets and prove that they chose them randomly. For the purposes of this talk, we'll just consider all parties, including the adversarial parties, uh, to just choose their tickets uniformly at random. The problem with this committee uh, lottery system approach is that we don't know the number of online users. So, a hard threshold like Algorand might result in too small of a committee. And a small committee means that the adversary might get lucky with a majority adversarial committee. If this happens even once, then the security of the blockchain is completely broken. Our approach to this is to use the top N lottery tickets you see as your local committee. This ensures that the committees are always large enough uh, to avoid the problem of the adversary getting lucky with a majority adversarial committee. However, this brings its own problems. 
Specifically, uh, the adversary can force different committee views by selectively sending messages to different participants. Our insight is that uh, close enough is good enough in this case. We show that existing Byzantine agreement solutions can provide security guarantees with close enough committees and minor modifications. We also provide and analyze a protocol for getting committees which are close enough. For the remainder of this talk, we'll dive a little bit further into the details. First, we'll define the sleepy model and then discuss uh, what challenges the sleepy model presents and how the adversary might try to use it against us. Then we'll discuss how we overcome these challenges to present our committee selection procedure and define our notion of close enough. Finally, we'll show how our notion of close enough fits into existing Byzantine agreement solutions. The defining characteristic of the sleepy model is that anyone can go to sleep or wake up at any time. And there's no sleep talking. While you are asleep, you are silent. There's no limit on the number of users who are asleep, but we do get the guarantee that the awake users are majority honest. The adversary can corrupt anyone at any time subject to that constraint. This matches Algorand and is stronger than their original sleepy model. To deal with this stronger corruption model, we borrow ideas from Algorand and select a new committee for each message. This prevents the adversary from uh, targeting committee members for corruptions because by the time the adversary discovers the committee member, they've already served their purpose and sent their one and only message. As a reminder, Algorand chose co its committee based on a set threshold, which could possibly lead to a very small committee because not all users are uh, guaranteed to be online. And to guarantee a large enough committee for safety, we choose based on the top end tickets seen. However, this has the problem that not all parties are guaranteed to see the same committee. It's worth noting that in Algorand, parties might also not see the full committee. However, honest, uh, honest players still accept messages from any member of the committee, even if it's received later. And intuitively, this is because a lottery ticket that is higher than a constant threshold is still higher than that constant threshold, regardless of when it's received. This unfortunately is not the case in our approach. Let's go through an example. Here we've pictured the tickets from the highest to the lowest. So Alice has the highest lottery ticket and Dave has the lowest lottery ticket. For this setup, the adversary, Charlie, talks to just Alice. And of course, all the honest parties send their messages to everyone. Now at this point, Alice sees all the tickets and she takes her top three to be her committee. This is Alice, Bob, and Charlie. However, Bob and Dave did not receive a message from Charlie. And so they fill that third gap using Dave. This is problematic because Alice thinks that Dave should not be in the committee, but Bob and Dave think he should be in the committee. And now Bob, uh, Dave is honest, but he doesn't appear in all views. And we can't simply leave this problem alone. A common tool in uh, Byzantine agreement protocols is we can enforce that each party uh, sends one message. So Charlie the adversary cannot send a different message to Alice as he does to Bob. However, in this case, Alice sees Charlie and not Dave and Dave sees Dave but not Charlie. And we can't enforce that two different parties send the same message. So the tool that allows uh, each party to only send one message limits the power of the adversary because they can't play both sides, both zero and one. However, the different committee views 
lets the adversary play both sides anyway. This means that Alice and Dave might see very, very different message sets, which could lead them to disagree in the Byzantine Agreement Protocol, which is disastrous. It's also worth noting that we can't simply extend the views to let Alice use Dave or let Dave use Charlie. The reason for this is that the adversary might claim to see an arbitrary committee. And from Alice's point of view, there's no difference between Bob and the adversary. A natural attempt to try and get closer committees is that if someone appears in many views, let's say over a half N, they should also appear in yours. And intuitively, it seems like appearing in many committees should mean that other parties will also use that party in their final committee view. However, as we explore further in the paper, uh, this approach breaks down rather quickly. And our insight is to only remove parties from our view. Don't try to discover more. And we do this while maintaining uh, the core properties of being close enough uh, in views and also uh, having majority honest views. Now let's discuss our committee selection procedure. Uh, the general idea behind it is that everyone will send their messages and then um, everyone will, after receiving their messages, everyone will discuss which messages to actually use. So for the first step, everyone broadcasts their ticket to everyone. And locally, you'll take the top N, in this case, three, to be your first view. The second step is to discuss these first views. So everyone broadcasts their first view and you form a list pictured on the right that's the union of the first views that you receive. Note that these lists don't have to be the same for all parties because the adversary still might selectively send messages to some parties, but not to others. And once we have this list of the union of the first views, we take the top N, in this case three, to be our discussion view. The final step is to intersect the two views. So in this case, um, the intersection of the first view and the discussion view is A and C. So that's what Bob will use as his final committee view. Now that we've discussed the committee selection procedure, let's discuss the properties that it achieves and define our notions of close enough. The first property is that the union of honest views is not too big. Uh, specifically, all the, honest, the union of honest views should not be more than size n. The second property is that there should be a large honest core, which is seen by all honest parties. Now let's discuss uh, how our committee selection procedure achieves these views. So we can observe that the discussion list is a superset of the honest first views. Uh, this is because all honest parties will send their, their first view to everyone. And so they always appear in the discussion list. And we know that anyone not in the top N of the union of the honest first views, like F and E here, certainly will not be in the top N of the discussion view. Intuitively, we can see that even if D were also present in this discussion list, uh, E and F still would not be in the top three. So they get removed from all honest views. The second property is that we have a large honest core, which is seen by all honest parties. And to see this, we can start by envisioning a true list written in stone of all uh, lottery tickets which were submitted by honest parties, regardless of who they were sent to, or all tickets which were sent to any party, uh, regardless of who they were sent to. And we know that with high probability, over half the top N are honest. And this is because 
uh, the awake parties are majority honest. And so in this case, in this example, uh, A and B are the honest parties, and they will send their lottery ticket to every honest party. So they appear in every honest first list. And because they're in, already in the top N of the true list, uh, they also appear in the top N of the honest first lists. So they appear in the honest first views. This is because the adversary can't forge lottery tickets. Because they appear in all honest first views, they also appear in all honest discussion lists. And since, uh, again, since they appear in the top N of the true list, uh, they're going to appear in the top N of the discussion list. And so they'll be in the discussion view. Again, because the adversary can't forge lottery tickets. Then, since this honest core of A and B is in both the first view and the discussion view, it's in the intersection of the two, uh, which is the final view. Now that we've defined um, our notion of close enoughness, it's time to discuss the Byzantine agreement. Uh, and before we do that, though, we need to define a couple of tools. The first tool is zero one graded broadcast. Intuitively, this just ensures that the adversary can't send different messages to Alice and Bob. This was mentioned earlier. Uh, and so if the adversary were to send a one to Alice and a zero to Bob, then at least one of Alice and Bob would have to reject that message. For now, uh, just assume that we have this. This is a tool from previous work, which we adapt to the sleepy model, and you can find more details in the paper. The second tool we'll need is leader election. And the guarantee here is that half the time, uh, every honest party will see and interpret the clouds in the sky the same way. And the other half of the time, there's no guarantees. Uh, we borrow the mechanism for this directly from Algorand, and it still works in the sleepy model. Uh, the way it works is everyone submits a lottery ticket along with a coin flip. And whoever has the highest lottery ticket gets used as the leader. Now, if the leader happens to be honest, so if the honest parties, uh, or if the highest lottery ticket belongs to an honest party, everyone will see uh, the same leader and will use their coin flip. However, there's no guarantees if the adversary is honest, or is the, um, if the adversary possesses the highest lottery ticket. And since we don't know uh, when an honest leader is elected, that's why we still need the Byzantine Agreement Protocol. Speaking of which, uh, let's discuss that now. We're going to use a binary Byzantine Agreement Protocol from the work of Macaulay and Vikantonathan. Uh, it proceeds in a number of rounds, uh, the structure of which is shown on the screen. First, everyone will 0, 1 graded broadcast their value, uh, what they think that the value to be agreed upon is. Um, as a reminder, all 0, 1 graded broadcast does is ensure that uh, the adversary can't send a different message to Alice as they do to Bob. And this graded broadcast procedure uses our committee selection procedure as a black box. And uh, Changing the committee for each uh, round ensures that the adversary can't corrupt the committee since the message is already sent by the time uh, it discovers the committee. So once you receive all the votes uh, that you're going to receive for this round and see your final committee view, um, you consider whether you see uh, a potential agreement on either one, zero or one. If you see over a half n votes for zero, then it seems as if everyone is agreeing on zero. And so you should set your value equal to zero in order to come into agreement with them. Similarly, if um, there seems to be agreement on one, you should also set your value to one 
in order to come closer to agreement with them. And uh, otherwise, if there's no agreement, then you're going to set your value equal to the leader election result, which has some inherent randomness to it. So there's some hope to get close to uh, whatever agreement you may not see. And a note about the differences in the adaptation of this algorithm from previous work. Uh, in Algorand and also in Macaulay and Vikantonathan's work, uh, n is the expected or exact committee size. Here, n is the maximum committee size. Now, for this protocol to work and to guarantee uh, that everyone, every honest party agrees on this value uh, at the end of this, there are two properties we want to satisfy. The first property is that is consistency uh, and effectively says that agreement now uh, implies agreement later. So if all honest parties are unanimous on say zero, they should also be unanimous on zero at the end of the protocol. The key to this property is that there is a large honest core which is seen by all honest parties. So if all honest parties are unanimous on say zero, then the honest core will send votes for zero to every honest party and every honest party will accept these messages. Since they then accept uh, over a half n messages for zero, they'll set their value equal to zero. And so um, all honest parties after this round will continue to be unanimous on zero. And it's not too hard to see that this carries throughout the rest of the protocol any number of repetitions. Similarly, if all the honest parties were unanimous on one beforehand, they would all trigger the threshold to set their value equal to one and continue to be unanimous throughout the protocol. The second property we need is mutual exclusion between substeps A and substep B. Uh, and intuitively, this is because if one party sets zero and the other one sets one, they aren't progressing towards agreement with each other. However, it's all right for somebody to set zero and then another party to use the leader election result because the leader election result uh, is random and has a chance of progression towards whatever uh, was already agreed upon in, the, at case, in that example, zero. The key to this is the bound on the size of the union of honest views. And in particular, Alice and Bob can't trigger two different thresholds because they won't see enough votes. Uh, this is due to both this union uh, size limit and also the graded broadcast uh, protocol, which ensures that uh, the adversary can't send two different votes using the same party. So together, Alice and Bob see at most n votes. And in order for one of them to trigger the zero threshold and the other to trigger the one threshold, they would have to see a total of n plus two votes, which is it simply did not happen. In order to um, turn this binary Byzantine agreement protocol into a full multi-valued Byzantine agreement protocol for use in a blockchain, uh, we need some additional tools. We already mentioned 0-1 graded broadcast, uh, which just ensures that the adversary doesn't use the same party to send a message one to Alice and zero to Bob. Uh, another uh, protocol that we'll need for this purpose, or for the purpose of turning binary Byzantine agreement into a multi-valued Byzantine agreement is graded consensus. Um, and you can find more details about these protocols and our adaptations of them to the Sleepy model uh, in our full paper. Intuitively, they're very similar to uh, what we've already discussed. The first property of close enoughness, uh, that, the size of the, uh, that the size of the union of honest views is not too large, intuitively prevents the adversary from causing problems. And in the Byzantine Agreement Protocol, this prevented the adversary from causing one party, say Alice, to follow 
the seb step where they set zero and another one, another party, say Bob, to follow the sub step where they set one. In graded broadcast, this prevents the adversary from sending different messages uh, using the same party. The second property of close enoughness, a large honest core, which is seen by all honest parties, ensures that honest parties have the power to force progression. In the Byzantine Agreement Protocol, this was key in ensuring that um, if the honest parties were unanimous on a value before the Byzantine Agreement Protocol, they were also unanimous on the same value after the Byzantine Agreement Protocol. In graded broadcast, what this does is ensures that honest parties uh, accept all honest messages. As a summary, we presented a new Byzantine Agreement based blockchain for the Sleepy model. It does not fork, and transactions are confirmed as soon as they appear in the ledger. Thanks for watching, and if you're interested in finding out more, please take a look at our paper.